Hi, I'm Heinbuch. Good to have you back. I get asked a lot of questions about tape machines and tape, how to use it, which one to buy, so I thought I would make this video and clear up your questions and address a few tape myths I found in the way too. If you want to work with tape, there's one important question you have to ask yourself. Do I want to go lo-fi or hi-fi? Lo-fi is really easy to achieve. You can just buy the cheapest tape recorder you can find and use the cheapest tapes you can find. Leave the tapes even in the car over a hot summer so they get extra warbly. Overdrive it while you record it or just record it really low so the noise drowns out the sound almost and it becomes lost. Uh, design your own tape loops. Amulets made a lovely tutorial for that. And then have that run for hours upon hours. So the machine dirties up and all that will add to the wobbliness and dirtiness. So bad sound means good sound in that regard. And you get these beautiful textures that you can find all over Instagram these days. If you're looking for something portable to achieve that, I made a bias guide to dictaphones because dictaphones with the tiny cassettes are extra useful for that sound. And even the bigger ones that take full-size cassettes still sound really lo-fi and nice. If you're looking for a step up from that, I would suggest getting into the Marantz PMD or CP series. I know, these machines have gotten very expensive, but rightfully so. Because they sound great with electronic music. They record really hot and they retain a lot of the signal. Because most of these, especially the PMD222, I think, is mono full track. Which means the tape head uses the full size of the tape to record onto, instead of just a small part which will sound very good, especially with bass signals. If you check out the video I did on the YouTube Auto Library, all the tape loops that I did there were recorded with these machines and they sound pretty damn good for that. And these machines, they have all you need for experimenting with tapes. I think they're the be all and end all for these kind of cassette manipulation machines. Because you get pitch, you get half speed, all the inputs and outputs that you need. They've got XLR, they've got RCA, they've got even outputs like this external speaker out that will run into a modular. So, and headphones. This is just the perfect machine for creating electronic music. I'm probably bumping up secondhand prices even more, but what can I do? No one builds cassette machines like this anymore. And if you look inside one of these, you will realize why. There's so many complex parts in there. There is all this machine stuff and it takes forever to take one of these parts and put it back again. And it requires time and skill. Many professional workshops here in Germany will refuse to work with these professional recording machines because of that. Because they know it will take hours and it will cost much more than the unit is worth. I think if someone opens up a repair shop for these, there's a good market for that. What type of cassette tapes should you use with these then? I'm perfectly fine with these Super Ferro for professional applications that were made in Uganda and you can buy cheaply on Amazon. I think 12 euro costs a 10 pack or 5 pack, I don't remember quite rightly now. But these will have a very, very tapey sound. It means they sound overdriven, they've got noise, but that's something you kind of want to get that tape impact. If you want to use this as a playback device in a club, I love the old Maxell XLN2, the golden ones. They just sound gorgeous and they have the heft of the <laughs> Super Pharaohs without the noise. But then we're going price-wise into stupid territory because these can cost upwards to 15 to 20 euros now, which I think is ridiculous. But the question you might ask is, oh, can I use this to warm up my mixes? And I can only say, kind of. There's the Marantz CP430, which will be stereo, so it might be what you're looking for, but I'm against recording a digital mix onto tape unless you want to completely mess it up. As my old acoustics professor said, oh, here's this beautiful Ming vase. Let's smash it into 44,000 pieces and then put it back up together. It will be more beautiful then, right? I believe it's best to do as little as little round trips from the analog to digital, digital to analog converter as possible once the signal is recorded unless you're purposefully messing it up. So if you're using this to drive your mix really dirty, then it might work and you can be happy with that. But for subtle, 
a cassette tape is definitely the wrong choice. Even something as hi-fi as this Sony TCM 5D Pro 2, which is one of the best portable tape decks that you can buy. These were called the poor man's Nagra for a reason and many independent films were recorded with this where a Nagra was just too expensive. But this is not a very great creative machine. It's a nice machine to record and listen back tapes to, but it has no way to actually pitch it up or down, which is of course the most magical operation you can do with tape. Pitching it down as slow as possible and hearing the signal degrade but yet open up. If you want to work with loops, any cassette player will work. I don't make my own cassette loops because I find that fiddly. So I buy them from Tapeline Co. UK, where they have many different lengths, from 20 to 30 to 60 to 90 to 5 minutes. And use the offer code Heinbach for 10% off. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> Maybe mention my name and someday they'll send me a free cassette or something. Moving on from the cramped world of cassette tape to the big open world of reel to reel recorders. I bought my first reel-to-reel, -reel, this Nagra 364, six years ago and it was a life-changing moment because when I first recorded a track straight from the modular onto that, I realized how good tape can sound, at least if you have a good machine. It sounded better than anything I could come up with in the door. The sound was more cohesive, it had a certain character to it that I loved. Maybe that might also be a touch of nostalgia because this is the machine that most big movies of the 60s and 70s were recorded on, and especially nature documentaries. These cost as much as a high-end car back in the day, because they are machined to perfection. This is a beautiful example of engineering and just a joy to work with. These were also fixable and serviceable in the field. So if you were recording sound in the Serengeti, chasing lions and giraffes, this is the machine you wanted because it was reliable. And it sounded great, of course. In fact, I became such a fan of the Nagra and infected other people with that, that I had a band that was called Kudelski after the inventor of this machine. And much of the music that they hear in this episode is from that band. Now I've gotten a lot of questions about Nagras and people think these machines cost thousands upon thousands. No. This one, the Nagra 3, you can get still cheaply, four, five hundred, because these are really old machines. There are not many people anymore that can service these. I mean, and if the motor on these dies, it's done. You must find a replacement motor. This can't be remagnetized or anything because the tools that were used to make this are not available anymore. So this is kind of a risky thing to get. And it's part of the reason why I got the 4.2 down here because this always feels like it's on its way out, but it just sounds so good. The microphone preamp is fantastic. Everything you record with it sounds just just a touch bigger than life and that is what you want when you put a microphone on a sound source. It has three speeds and sounds really good on the highest and kinda lo-fi-ish on the lowest one but still very good so you won't get a lo-fi sound but that's where the dictaphones come from. You can try using the automatic uh, record mode for added lo-fi because then you'll get all kinds of crazy pumping as limiter tries to adjust the right level. And it sucks at that, frankly. I can recommend the Nagra 3 if you find it in good condition. Check for motor noises and scratches on the heads and if you have someone who can service it for you. And plan in 3 to 400 euros additional just for service costs. The next Nagra, the 4.2, I bought that for 800, including the power supply, which is a standard price right now. This is again a mono machine, and I love using the mono machines for experiments. And also, again, same as with the Narans, they're a mono full track, so they sound really full and thick. So I can recommend to even record on these, and the music will sound beautiful and nice. And then you can add some sort of stereo effects, stereo delays in the digital audio workstation to create a bigger sense of space. But the nice thing is that this sounds 3D even though it's recorded in mono. The signal gets a dimensional character that is not there when you record straight into the door. Sounds crazy, but it is. Hmm. 
It's just the way tape works, at least with these beautiful Nagra machines. The Nagras have banana inputs and outputs, which is really useful if you have a search or Buchla modular system, but else you can easily solder yourself an adapter for that. It's simple because it's just two wires you need to solder. If I had to choose only one Nagra, I would get a Nagra 4.2, because these are still readily serviceable, there are people that know how to do that, there are spare parts, and these have been used so much all over the world, that you'll find someone who can help you with it. And they don't break the bank, the stereo versions are the ones that are super expensive. Rightly so, these are like a pinnacle of recording. There are a few Nagras that I don't recommend. There's the E version, which is basically a cut down Nagra 3 with only one speed, which is like taking away all the fun <laughs> of recording with a Nagra. And it has a nice looking pink chassis, but it's not a very creative machine. And the speed that is locked in is also not the highest one. Then there's the Series Noir, these tiny spy recorders that look incredibly beautiful but they need a whole lot of periphery to use them for music recording and playback and also they lack the very speed. These are more cool museums pieces than actual creative tools I would say. Plus they're super expensive. Would I like to have one? Sure, but that's more a collector talking and not the musician. So I don't see the use of that so much. Now, if Nagras are way out of your budget, there are the UA Report monitors, which even back in the day were an alternative to the Nagras, most usually for journalism purposes. And these have four speeds, they don't go as fast as the Nagras, but they sound pretty damn good, and they can lo-fi, absolutely. But they have a lot of strange connectors, and Americans especially get confused by them, because they are DIN, meaning Deutsche Industrienorm, German Industrial Norm. But you can find them easily on Amazon for like one to two bucks. You can find these adapters, so you can use them with Jack. Now, why do I love these machines? Because I can do this, which is really hard to do with an Agra. Because an Agra loaded with batteries, such as this, it's loaded with batteries, weighs close to 12, 13 kilograms. Uh, that's 20 pounds. And it's a heavy machine. This one I can carry around with the handle and it's fine. With an Agra I can't go more than a few blocks. Now you want to look for the monitor version because the monitor version has three heads which means you can turn it into a tape echo. See the video that I made on that. And it also sounds beautiful. This is a new old stock machine so when I picked it up it had never been used it was just checked and then sent to me which was an amazing feeling to get a new tape machine uh, in 2000. 18, I think it was. So, and it cost me 400 euros. You shouldn't pay more than that for a new machine, and usually they're in the 150 to 300 euro range over here. The cheapest tape machine that I can recommend for experimenting and recording is the Tesla 1115. These Eastern Block machines work nicely, they're better than similar Akai's or Technics recorders of that area, and they look beautiful and you can get them for 80 euros, 60 euros, in a good state. Let's talk high-end stereo recorders you can use to track your whole mix. I personally track to a Telefunken M15 that you might have seen in a bunch of my videos already. This is something that I got as a gift from a theater that I was working at because it was just used as a desk in the opera. And they were throwing all these machines out because they were not in use anymore. And that's really sad. I saw a whole container full of the most beautiful high-end tape machines that you can imagine. German broadcast quality. And they were all completely rusted and dying in that container. In Berlin, analoge Tonstudio Technik.de helped me to get this fixed up. Basically, he tuned it exactly to how I like it. All the frequencies are tuned like a piano and for example when I record at the lower speed because at the lower speed the preamps have to work harder and they drive the tape harder so you actually get a tape sound <laughs> because in the higher speed mode it's not really noticeable you don't get much of a saturation it just sounds nicer but not tape exciting so I often record at lower speed if I want more excitement because the preamps work harder and I had it adjusted so there's more bass coming in through then. So this is perfect for 
let's say more lively music. This was about 350 euros of service time, but it was well worth it, because it saves me hours and hours of mixing time. Because the machine now acts as a master equalizer and compressor. It takes care of problematic frequencies, evens out harsh transients and makes everything sound nicer and more cohesive. It is really that mystical tape glue at work here, which is the combination of the saturation and the frequency response of the tape itself. So for those of you that still think tape is a hassle, uh -uh. it just makes everything easier, for me at least. And the good thing is, I don't have to use it. I can always track to digital if something should work with the machine. But for now, let me find some wood to knock on. It's been doing perfectly and I've absolutely had no problems with it. An alternative machine to the Telefunken M15 that I can recommend is the Revox B77. These are semi-pro machines that sound good, have variable speed and are easily to find and shouldn't set you back too much. What tape should you use with your reel-to-reels? That's an easy answer. Get the one that is available and have it measured in to that. I use new old stock pair 468 tape for the Nagras and 468 tape new from RNG or Pyrrol or RMI or whatever that company is called right now. It changes all the time for the M15. The reason I'm doing that is because the telephone can always run with that and the older Nagra also. So I can use the tape with each of these. I found that the 468 tape sounds good with the Nagras and the M15 if you measure it to the machine. And you have to find someone to do that for you because you need the original test tone tapes to do that nicely. That's all the questions I can think about right now. If you've got any more, do leave them in the comments or go to the subreddit where there are more people than me who know about tape and can help you out. So that's it for this video. Thank you all for watching and see you in the next one. Bye.